wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, by angels and seraphs in heaven adored, I know Thou art mine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful I know Thou art mine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful Lord. And uh, you can't sing enough about Jesus and all that He's done and how He's used different people like Brother Paul, and the Lord gets the credit for that. All right, we hope you're comfortable this morning. We are going to be diving right into our message, which is actually a part two that we did a couple weeks ago. So this, of course, as you know, is um, only the second king uh, to rule, and uh, well, I'm sorry, the third king, and uh, David is the true first king in the sense of God's choice and so let's uh, open in a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing as we get started today. Father in heaven, as we settle ourselves, we need to have open ears, open hearts, open eyes. We've already had open hands. We gave to you. Now, Father, we know that as you speak back to us today, Father, in your word, it is not, dear Father, uh, an antiquated message. These principles are timeless. The lessons that we need in the 21st century were the lessons that were needed in the 9th century B.C. And so, dear Father, we are certainly, uh, we haven't outgrown anything. We, dear Father, have often forgotten thy word at the cost of our own success. And, Lord, we need to be good lights in this dark world that we call America. The city on a hill, well, it looks pretty dark on the hill right now. But let us light up that hill again. Let the church take the lead. Let us, dear Father, rule and reign for Jesus right now in our homes and in our churches. And may Christ sit on the throne of our hearts. May, Lord, your kingship be evident to all that we are under your management. To that end, Father, we ask your help right now that you would assert yourself and all your prerogatives will be followed. For all this we'll pray and ask and thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. It is impossible to understand Rehoboam without understanding the family he came from, the family in which he grew up. It's just impossible. There really is no way to understand anyone when they are separated from their upbringing. Because I do believe that... Uh, the way a tree ends up growing is the bent that it received as a twig. And so we see that this man had a bent that was given to him in those early years. So Rehoboam, in looking at his family, we immediately see that he was taught from two opposite philosophies of life. He was taught from two opposite philosophies of life. That of Solomon on the right and that of his mother, Naama, the Ammonitess, on the left. Now, you know in 1 Kings 14, 21 and verse 31, we have her name mentioned at the beginning of his reign and then at the close of it. Why would God do that? To tell us that she had an a, uh, uh, influence that was cast over his life, that really haunted his life. He could hear her voice in his mind. And many a time, she undoubtedly, changed his mind about certain policies that he was going to enact. And so there it was, the tug of war between what his father said in the early years and what his mother continually said through the rest of his life. Now Solomon was unchallenged in his mental authority. He was the wisest man who ever lived. Anyone who got in an argument with Solomon lost before they opened their mouth. He had no equal. And so he had mental authority. 
But because of his multiple marriages, that sapped all of his moral authority. So in a, in a sense, he was a mental giant, but a moral midget, and thus became a freak. And don't think that that wasn't lost on his son, Rehoboam. You know, dad is so smart, but dad is also not cool. He thought his mom was cool. Now it's important to be cool, not to be right. And so Naamah didn't have mental authority, nor moral authority. But she was a pampered, pagan, pretty princess with the morals of an alley cat. But she was cool. Boy, she looked pretty in those dresses. She could sure fix herself up. And she had all the makeup and she had all the jewelry and she could prance around. To be quite honest with you, I believe that her authority basically came through manipulation. Manipulation. When she wanted to get her way, maybe she cooked a special meal that Solomon liked. Maybe she dressed very seductively. Maybe she could turn on the feminine charm. She would do whatever she had to do to get what she wanted. Naamah existed in an environment of competition, and she could only rise by selfish manipulation of her husband and then later her son. Like all the other wives, Naamah had an agenda. She was a woman on a mission, and it was moral and religious revolution. Now, I don't believe that all the wives really cared that much about changing uh, Jerusalem into a different kind of city and really remake the whole nation after their own culture that they left. But many of them did, and Naamah was one of them. And so we see that where all these women came from, we see that they practiced idolatry. They also were much looser in their morals. So, monotheism and morality, which did not exist among Canaanite nations, these women, including Naamah, snared Solomon into an ancient version of multiculturalism. Multiculturalism existed in 9 BC. And so what is multiculturalism? Where there is a plurality of traditions and a plurality of beliefs, including religions. And all of this plurality is to be accepted on equal footing with biblical morality. And that's where you get into trouble. So Rehoboam ultimately sided with his mother's grand purpose, and that was to live like the other nations around them. Under Rehoboam, idolatry exploded with popularity. It was already deeply entrenched through Solomon's compromises. But after Rehoboam came on the scene, he didn't care. He didn't in any way discourage it. And so it exploded in popularity and a shocking increase in sexual perversions immediately took place. I want you to see 1 Kings 14.22. 1 Kings 14.22. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. So they were again smashing all records. There was more bed hopping, more lewdness, more drunkenness, more thievery. Crime went up. For they also built them high places and images and groves and every high hill and under every green tree. You know, now we see pagan religions are flourishing. Their coffers are overflowing. Much of the money from the treasury is being diverted into their channels. Isn't it interesting? It's impotent religion. You can't lift anybody up. It's a convenient religion compromising religion. It drags people down. And so we see that these two things, they just go together. They're cause and effect. It's the yin and the yang. Immorality and false religion. And so we see that this is definitely something that is out of control. And in verse number 24, it says, and there were also sodomites in the land 
And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Sodomites, of course, are male homosexuals. And so now we see male prostitution, male homosexuality. Oh, my friend, this sounds so much like America today. They're all coming out of the closet. They're being wined and dined at the White House. We understand, of course, that this is another consequence of having, again, a powerless religion. Ladies and gentlemen, all this happened under this man's watch. So a pagan agenda in the home greatly influenced Rehoboam. And ultimately, if even by indifference, he just looked the other way perhaps, or maybe he jumped in there and helped that agenda along. What is our agenda? Our agenda is the Bible. Our agenda is Jesus Christ. That's our agenda. And so we got to make sure that we don't fight for the wrong side. You wear the uniform, you stay on Jesus' side. And so this is so very important. So Rehoboam, he basically uh, continued the agenda of his mother. According to 1 Kings 14.21, Rehoboam became king when he was 41 years old. He reigned 17 years, and he died at the age of 58. Now, chapter 11, verse 42 of the same book says that Solomon reigned for 40 years, which means that Rehoboam had never known anything but a life of privilege. He was one year old when his dad became king. Now, Lamentations 3.27 says that young men do better when they start out with adversity. Here's what it says. Lamentations 3.27, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. May I include the fairer sex in that? It's also good for a woman to bear the yoke in her youth. But Rehoboam was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. You know, by the time Rehoboam was a teenager, Solomon's wisdom had already transformed the nation into an economic powerhouse. The biblical record of Solomon's wealth staggers the imagination. We're, we're not even at that level right now. It can be summed up in 1 Kings 10.21. 1 Kings 10.21 says, And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. It was expected. Solomon's uh, utensils were made out of precious metals. Even the drinking cups were made out of pure gold. Of course, this was part of God's original reward to Solomon for asking for wisdom as his chief desire and greatest need. And for that reason, remember, God said, Because you have asked for this thing, for wisdom to judge between right and wrong, to judge my people, I'll give you wealth. And God gave him wealth. 1 Kings 3.13. God gave him wisdom, and through the wisdom he got the wealth. Solomon's wisdom raised the standard of living for everybody, especially for his family. It was the highest levels in the world. No one lived better than an Israelite. And especially those who work for Solomon, who were part of his administration, woo, they fared sumptuously every day, wore the best clothes, had the best hours, took the best vacations. And Solomon's royal court, wow. His immediate family, they lived in the palace. They went swimming, they went camel riding, they traveled all over the place and sometimes went sailing, no doubt. I imagine they did about the same thing that millionaire kids do today. But as 1 Kings 10.21 says, they all took those luxuries for granted. It was not accounted of. Nobody stopped to think, do you know the price that was paid to get this? Just to have cups like this? It took a man with real wisdom, making all the right decisions, employing the right people. A lot of miners had to be employed to dig it out of the hills. A lot of men had to drag it all the way here. Then it had to go to the smelting shop and be molded by a craftsman. 
Nobody thought about that. I believe that Rehoboam grew up a spoiled child. He probably never had to work a day in his life for anything. It was just given to him. Rehoboam just expected to live the good life as if it were his right by birth. Hmm. Thus he showed no sense of gratitude, no sense of responsibility, and no sense of purpose. That's what happens when you enjoy benefits for too long without any kind of suffering. You know, it's amazing. We're fallen creatures. You cannot enjoy unbroken blessings without the most need for greatest watchfulness over your spirit. At first, Solomon raised the standard of learning higher than any nation before it. In his prime, Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs which is the greatest book of wisdom in all of ancient literature. And at first he lived by them. But all this penetrating insight was mixed with moral and spiritual compromises. You know, that's the only way you get great men to fall. You must dilute them a little at a time. And so in his later years, he was thoroughly demoralized and his wisdom was virtually destroyed. And how was it done? A little here, a little there. Just a drop of poison here, a drop of poison there. Solomon became a moral and spiritual compromiser. And I want to talk about compromising. Now listen, it may be a dirty word to us, but it also has its rightful place. In politics, nothing would get done without some compromising. But you never compromise your beliefs, your convictions, what's truly right. That's not for sale. You don't... You don't Give that away. Amen? And so again, we see that he began to deal in compromising issues that were really, truly the destruction of the nation's morals. It became a deadly double standard. I believe Solomon's initial reason for building pagan shrines was to get his wives off his back. They kept clamoring for this, but it didn't end there, did it? Next, they wanted him to attend worship services. He said, no, no, no. I built that for you. I got my own house to go to. I worship in the temple. And they clamored again and badgered him and begged him until finally said, okay, I'll go, I'll go. But it didn't end there either, did it? Next, they wanted Solomon to give their gods equal status in the land. He said, no, we can't do that. We are a Jewish people. We follow the Mosaic law. But again, they said, that's not fair. And they begged him and badgered him and needled him. And finally, Solomon did. Poor Solomon. He's on the slippery slope of compromise. At first, he had to endure their idolatry. Then he had to excuse it. Then he had to endorse it. And then when he endorsed it, he established it. That's the slippery slope of compromise. Solomon never publicly renounced God. You won't find it. He never renounced God. He never even renounced his own writings. But his personal compromises with evil divided his heart. He had a double standard. When he was with his wives, he acted one way. When he was with the priests, he acted another way. He had a double life. He had a double standard. The kingdom was divided in Rehoboam's reign because years before that, Solomon's heart was divided. When families are divided, it's because hearts are divided. When churches are divided, it's because hearts are divided. The first division comes in the heart. And when your heart is divided, just give it time, everything will be divided. Did you know that this nation right now is divided? I'm not just talking about, you know, Republicans and Democrats. I'm not talking about two parties. We're divided about what's right and wrong. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we know that this division goes all the way back to the human heart. Nations are no better than the individuals that make them up. And so, another thing that is very interesting about Solomon's divided heart is this, is that a divided heart is never static, is fluid. When your heart is divided, the ratio is always moving around. 
For example, if you're sitting here today with a divided heart, you have two different sets of values that you tolerate in your life, you come to church and I push you maybe a little bit more to the right. And so now the division is 60-40, maybe 70-30, maybe 80-20. Then you go back into the world and then your divided heart slides the other direction. How do we know that a divided heart is fluid? God told us that's what happened to Solomon. I want you to see it for yourself. This is 1 Kings 11 verse number 4. 1 Kings 11.4 says this, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. That word perfect there means simply of one piece. A whole piece. It does not mean sinless, which nobody can be, but it means single, which everybody can be. He had a single heart at the beginning, but then he had a divided heart. So God will bless nothing but singleness of heart. That's it. He won't bless duplicity. The early church in the book of Acts is the standard of all church success. You know why? You know why we still use them as the gold standard? Because it says in Acts 2.46, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. The church had one heart. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what's so beautiful about the early church, is the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And the singleness of heart is what God is always looking to bless. The announced attack of the Egyptian king Shishak, I believe, was, was really Rehoboam's last chance to unite the kingdom by first uniting their hearts against a common enemy. You know, it's just amazing to me that it appeared that he was ready to possibly call the entire nation back to God, but then he stopped short. I want you to see it for yourself. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. Now, if you'll notice in verse number 1, here's what it says. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. What did he do? He strengthened the uh, outposts. He gave them munitions. He posted guards. He had his lookouts. He did his best to repair all the breaches and the walls and the fortifications. You know, he, he thought, I'm so smart. I'm just like my dad. No, he's not smart. He's a fool. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. It's really funny, isn't it? Whenever we take precautions and try to strengthen ourselves so that we have some kind of defense, but if we forsake the Lord, God brings in a shyshack and he just walks right over everything. Isn't that amazing? You can't buy enough insurance if you're not pleasing God. No, you can't. You can't take enough pills. You can't have enough friends in high places. Nope. And so it just, all of a sudden, just like chaff, it just got blown away. And so it says he came with 1,200 chariots and three score thousand horsemen, uh, 60,000. And the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt. Uh, the Lubims and the Sucklims and the Ethiopians. And so they came out of the hills. They came out of the caves. They came out of the mountains. He just rounded up thousands of, of really hardy men that were truly bloodthirsty. And he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. He just rolled right over them. And then he shows up at Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah, the prophet of Rehoboam, and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. 
He said, because you're practicing idolatry and you have forsaken the temple and nobody cares about what the law says anymore, guess what? I'm just going to leave you in the hands of Shishak, your enemy. I'm not going to defend you. Isn't that amazing? Shishak comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. But the worst aspect is to be left of God. When enemies show up, that shouldn't bother us at all. It's when God disappears. Never mind the enemies. Just make sure God doesn't hide his face. In fact, uh, by the way, when enemies show up, when you know you're right with God, that's the happiest time of life. You know, Joshua, you ought to go back and read the story of Joshua where at the beginning of his commission to go into the promised land. In Joshua chapter 1, God over and over says, now don't you be afraid. Be, be, be brave. Be strong. You know, we all think that Joshua was just so fearless, but actually God saw his courage fluctuating, going up and down. Sometimes God said right before a battle, now Joshua, don't you be afraid. Not a single man will stand before you if you're faithful to me. By chapter number 10, the armies are getting bigger against Joshua. Five kings decide to take him on. He is outnumbered 100 to 1, and they got chariots. What's Joshua got? Sandals. No horses, no chariots. Go back and read Joshua chapter 10. They marched for all day to get to the battle place. Marched all night. Had no sleep. Had no real sophisticated weapons at all. Then they go up against a massive army that outnumbers them 100 to 1 with the best military hardware in existence at that time. And the Bible says they slaughtered them. But if you go back and read it, it says that the Lord gave them the victory. So they marched all day to get there. Then they fought with just very minimal weapons, maybe in some cases sticks. They beat the mightiest army on the earth. Five kings who all came together for one super army. And then Joshua said, we can't stop now. Sun, halt. And he lifted his hand and told the sun to stop in its course. And God gave him another 24 hours. But they had already been up for 48 hours. And yet God gave him strength. Can you imagine a, a fight going on that long? 72 hours long? When the Lord is with you, you can beat the odds. Rehoboam, what should have bothered him was, you know what, we all need to get together. We need to call a massive convocation at the temple. And we need to repent of our sin and get rid of these idols right now. <laughs> he came so close, didn't he? And if you'll notice, it says there in verse number 6 of 2 Chronicles 12, whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said, the Lord is righteous. Yeah, that's what everybody says when they're backed into a corner. When you have no other alternatives, no other, well, there's no options left. So I guess I'll turn to God. He had no choice but to turn to God. And so what does he do? The Lord says, you know what? It's not perfect obedience. It certainly is not thorough repentance. But you know what? It does count. It's honoring of me. It is admitting that I made a mistake. And therefore, I will partially recognize this. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, and the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. That's where the majority of Christians are living at right now. They get into a real fight with evil, and they realize they're outnumbered, outmatched, and so they flee to God while the pressure's on. And they get some deliverance. They get some, but they don't get total victory. Everybody's living in that in-between limbo. Nevertheless, they shall be as servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. Isn't it interesting? Sometimes people complain, I don't want to live by all these rules in the Bible. I don't like the Bible's rules. It's too restrictive. Oh, what a blessed life it is, though. So the Lord says, okay, you don't want to live by my laws? I'll let you feel what it's like to live by the laws of the devil, the laws of the flesh. And so again, we see that the Lord said, 
I'm going to let a few more years go by and see if the light comes on in his head. Rehoboam, he can compare both now side by side. But you know what? When the pressure was off, he reverted back. Shishak left town with all the nation's treasures. He looted the palaces, and he also took the precious things right off the walls in the temple. And so they went out of town, loaded down with all the national treasures. And that's pretty humiliating for the king. And, of course, if you read on in this chapter, it says that to hide his embarrassment, he made brazen shields to replace Solomon's gold ones. And then instead of hanging them back up on the wall where the other ones were, he put them under lock and key. And then when he decided to come out, he said, hey, get the shields out. I'm going to show up today. How ridiculous. He cared more about his personal image, about a photo opportunity, if I could say it like that. I want to make sure all the shields are up there when I'm prancing around. You know, the main thing, he wanted to look good. But then as soon as it was over and the service came to an end, they went around and took all the shields down and locked them back up again. They were afraid somebody would steal even those. It's so ridiculous. A man so conscious of his image when the entire nation is rotting. Well, we see in verse number 11 when king, it says, And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came out, fetched them, and brought them again into the guard chamber. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah, things went well. Isn't it amazing that you take one or two steps toward God, he takes one or two steps toward you? Isn't it amazing? God will, will always respond to uh, acts of humility, I guarantee you his heart is not fully humble. But at least he's not prancing around like a prima donna. And God hates pride. You know, it's obnoxious to God. So just the very fact that he walked with a soft step and hung his head down and just acted more humble, and God certainly respected that. It was a step in the right direction. Well, Unfortunately, when the pressure was off, it all went back the other way. Verse 13, of course, begins to point this out. And he said in verse 14, He did evil because he pre prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Okay, I want to close with that verse, which I think summarizes the real secret of failure for him. The Bible says he did evil. Because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Okay, here's the thing. Unless you make up your mind to serve the Lord, unless you begin to prepare yourself to resist temptation and evil, unless you're in all the way on this thing, there will be people with a stronger will that will come into your life, and they will, they will co-op you. They will put strings on you and make a puppet out of you. And that's what happened to Rehoboam. He too had a harem. And they did the same thing to him that they did to his daddy. How very sad. Rehoboam did evil because he did not get his heart ready. He did not prepare it with encouragements. <laughs> this to me is the greatest application of that verse. You know what you should do when discouragement is everywhere? You find discouragement in your life, discouragement at job, discouragement at home, discouragement at church, discouragement in politics, discouragement everywhere, everywhere you look. What are you supposed to do? Encourage yourself. Did you know that that was the greatest lesson that I think he could learn from his grandfather, David? Do you remember Ziklag? Remember what happened at Ziklag? At Ziklag, David... And his 600 mighty men were all camping, and the Amalekites swoop in, and they steal everything. Now, the men were gone, but they stole the wives and the children, basically took all their stuff, and then burned the campsite. He shows up at Ziklag, and the Bible tells us that he stepped aside from everybody who was ready to stone him, and he encouraged himself in the Lord. And he said, where's the Urim and Thummim? You remember those little, little stones that were used to get the will of God in those days? He sought the Lord. 
Should I pursue after him? He said, go get him. You're going to get everything back. And I can imagine David thinking to himself, really? I'm going to get everything back? Woohoo! And up on his horse he goes. It's really amazing that if you'll let God's promises encourage you, sometimes God will say, if you'll just go after it, I'll give you everything back. David got everything back. It's just amazing to me how little we let God encourage us. Just, just remember this. There will always be bad news in the world. Always be bad news. There's always bad news everywhere. But just remember, God's encouragements are greater than the discouragements. And so God can encourage you above and beyond what the world can discourage you. Would you let him do it? Well, that's something that he didn't do. He could have gone to the temple. He could have called in the priest and said, hey, let's have a big session. I'll order the pizza. We're going to sit up all night. I want to know what the Bible says about this. But he never did that. Also, he did not prepare it with fortifications. He did not prepare his heart with fortifications to seek the Lord. You know, as soon as you declare, I'm going to go to church more faithfully. I'm going to read my Bible more faithfully. I'm going to pray more faithfully. But as soon as you announce that, the devil says, all right, I'm going to bring the battle to you. I'm going to launch an invasion at you. Isn't it interesting that the devil knows about our plans? And so here we go, Proverbs 4.23. The Bible says, keep the heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. It's interesting that we are to keep our heart and the treasure of the heart, the good things of the heart, we're to keep those from being stolen. The thief is going to come and steal those out of our heart. Rehoboam sat and listened to his daddy, and then he went home to the, his mama, and his mama stole that stuff out of his heart. Took it right out of his heart. And so we see again that he did not build a wall of protection against those influences. We all need to have fortifications around our heart. Don't just turn on the computer and surf the internet wildly. Don't surface, don't channel surf on the television. Have some fortifications in place. You know, Proverbs 25, 28 says that a broken man is like a city broken down and the walls are destroyed. His spirit is overrun by the enemy. And I believe that happened to him. You know, I believe that seeking is a continual state of preservation. That as long as you are seeking something from the Lord, you're happy. Have you ever heard someone say, you know what, I've been working so hard to buy this thing, and now that I bought it, I'm less happy than when I was trying to save up for it. It's like when we dream about a vacation. Oh, this vacation's going to be so great. And then we take it and we say, uh, it wasn't as good as it was in my head. Isn't it funny how the process of seeking and acquiring is often more exciting and more rewarding than the thing that is gotten? I believe when it comes to spiritual things, just stay a seeker. When you get one blessing, say, okay, I'm ready for the next blessing and the next reward and the next privilege. Just start setting your sights for the next thing. You know, that's just where happiness is. Do you know Psalm 34.10 says that, that the seekers who have secular things that they want to get after, fleshly things they want, they're called, they're called lions, young lions. They're in their prime. Psalm 34.10 says they're young lions in their prime, and they know how to hunt things down, but the Bible says they go home hungry. But the Bible says those that seek the Lord should not lack any good thing. Stay seeking the Lord and you won't lack any. You'll be totally satisfied. I believe that if Rehoboam had just stayed a seeker, always seeking to glorify God, always seeking the benefit of the people, always seeking ways to educate them in the things of God, if he had just been seeking those things, he would have been so very, very happy. But he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. He was self-seeking not seeking the things of God. How sad is that? 
And so there's a lesson from the man who I believe is the poster boy for, oh, spoiled, ignorant, and narcissistic kind of guy. He's a narcissist. He wants to seek for himself. And so this is the kind of king that God put down in his word for us to say, you know what? I don't want to resemble this. I don't want to follow in his footsteps. I want to make sure that I do the exact opposite of what he did. When you look at a guy like Rehoboam, just say, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what he did. I'm not going to think like him. I'm not going to act like him. I'm not going to follow the same path that he followed. Just take the opposite path. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.